As you guys are taking your kids out, I uh, want to remind you about a couple really critical things. The core of our, of our missions week, and the core activity is going to be prayer. We've already, uh, Andy said, I'm going to kick it off. In reality, we're actually in the second quarter. We, many of you joined us already this morning as you see these signs around our sanctuary. Uh, we prayed around this. Uh, for each of these uh, missionaries, for four or five minutes, missionary, or minutes for each missionary in small groups. Um, and so we've prayed for these folks for about 45 minutes straight this morning. Um, in the back, you're going to find two guides for prayer. This guide is the more permanent one, has all of our missionaries, more information about them. Uh, this is the long-term thing we would want you to keep on your dinner table uh, or in your car to pray with with your kids uh, moving forward and praying for our missionaries. So that's one thing. But the second is specific. You'll see a sheet in the back on the information table as you leave uh, this morning uh, is this sheet, which is a prayer guide front and back for exactly how you can be praying this week. Uh, and so I would encourage you to do this as a husband and wife or get a friend and do this or as a family uh, and simply, very quickly, very simply pray through each of these um, prayer, this prayer guide uh, this week. It ha- provides you a scripture uh, to pray around, provides you some prompts for praying up and worshiping God, for praying in, for asking God to do something in, in you and through you, and then praying out as we pray for particular people around us and in the nations. And so I'd encourage you to grab that. So that's a core part of our missions week. Also, I want to remind you on Thursday night, there's a prayer walk at the UWG campus as we're going to pray over that campus with some of our, led by some of our CO students. Uh, who are with us here, and then also Wednesday night, we have an international dinner where we're going to hear about how we as a church uh, can get more involved in the life of supporting missionaries. So, big week in life of our church. I would love for you to participate with us in all those things, and in particular, in praying with us. All right, as Andy said, we are in in Genesis chapter 12 is where we're going to be this morning as we take a break from our series that we entitled Encountering Encounters with Jesus, and we're going to take two weeks to kind of look at and re- re- remember um, why we exist and our mission uh, as a church. We, we want to make disciples who know God, who grow together, and who... All right, know God, grow together, and third, reach our world. There we go. All right, so that is, that is a core part of what we want to be about, so that you are not... Um, following Jesus until you are participating in the mission of Jesus in this world. So that means more than simply you personally knowing Jesus or us gathering together and having our our cool church experience, but also wanting to reach the world because that is the mission God has given us. Genesis chapter 12 is where we're going to be. I'm going to read out, out loud while you read along in your Bibles. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This ends the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. May the grass wither and the flower fade, but may the word of our God, may it stand forever. Well, do you know your DNA? Probably not. I mean, you know where it came from. You know, you know, you, you've seen a helix, it's that helix thing that you see pictures of. We're, most of us don't have any, you know, and I include myself in this, we don't have much of an understanding of it. We just know that we're like in clone sheep and like other things now uh, because of our understanding of DNA. But in recent years, uh, DNA for humans has, uh, in, in discovering our DNA, has actually become something that is... Um, is, is creating a lot of stories and interesting uh, encounters in people's lives. In recent years, there's been story after story of, of people coming out of people who are discovering lost parents and siblings who they didn't know that they had. They rediscovered things about themselves and their heritage because they took a test, something like 23andMe. Well, there was actually one of our missionaries, someone who we supported for a number of years. His name was Clint Watson. Um, this is Clint. Clint, uh, a number of years ago, his children gave him a DNA test for Christmas, and he took it. Now, some of you, just to give you fair warning on this, if you take that test, you're put into a data bank where other people who share your DNA can find you, and you can find them if they share your DNA. He found out 
that he had a Finnish ancestry, which was news to him. In the course of investigating this further, he found out that the man who he thought had been his father was not his biological father, and that actually his father was a man who had uh, lived in Finland other than a brief stint in the United States. Through this same testing site, Clint came to find out that he had living siblings, not just in the United States, but also in Finland that he had never met or did not, was not aware of. Eventually, in the course of time, he discovered, uh, he found these siblings, and they, they got to know each other, and they ultimately sent him this picture. And Clint looked at it and was amazed. You can see Clint's, this is Clint's father on the left, and that is Clint on the right. His whole life, he had wondered why he did not look like his other family members. Well, now he knew. And he was blown away because in the picture in front of him was a man who looked just like him. He began, he rediscovered or discovered for the first time that he shared with that man a common DNA. And what is our DNA as the people of God? Well, in order to help us understand our DNA as the people of God, we go back to one of the earliest stories when God did a shaping and forming work and calling out for himself a people. The people of God share a common DNA. And we share a particular earthly father, or a spiritual father, in, we, in that the New Testament says that all who trust and believe in Jesus, that we are children of Abraham. Now, many of you did not grow, in the church, grow up in the church, but many of us did. And that anybody who grew up in the church 30 years ago remembers singing a song that went something like this. Father Abraham... Had many sons. Yes, you got it. And the story of Abe helps us understand our DNA for our understanding our identity and our experience in this world. In fact, in Galatians chapter 3, it says that those who are, have trust in Jesus, that they all, all those who trust in Jesus are the spiritual sons and daughters of Abraham, Jew and Gentile alike. And it's not pretend, it's real. We are the real spiritual sons and daughters. We carry the legacy and the promises that were given to Abraham. And so we look at Genesis chapter 12, where God himself calls Abraham, and in so doing calls a people to himself. And we, in Genesis 12, we see very quickly in this, in a very small way, as DNA is, and he's just these few verses, our spiritual DNA. And that DNA tells us three things. First is this, that we are a people who are saved by grace. That we are a people who are saved by grace. Now, there is no proof text for this in verses 1 through 3, the passage I just read to you. In order to understand this, you would have to have read the first 11 chapters of the Bible. Now, the first two chapters of the Bible go really, really, really good. God makes all things. Everything is good and wonderful. And then in Genesis chapter 3, what happens? Things go really, really badly. Man falls, we separate ourselves from God, and immediately after we leave the garden, after God separate, we are separated from God, we run from him, what begins to happen? The world begins to fall apart. Brother kills brother. And what we see in chapters 3, 4, and 5 is the world gets more and more despotic and depraved. So much so that in Genesis chapter 6, God comes in and says, that's it, I'm judging the world, I'm starting all over again, and he sends a flood and destroys the whole world. But he goes back and he says, I'm starting with one man and his family, and his name is Noah. And what happens beginning in chapter 7? Noah and his family begin to propagate, and things go really, really badly, really, really quickly, right? Noah has a son who finds his dad naked and drunk. Not a good way for, you know, makes for some great family stories, not for a great spiritual lineage, and things immediately begin to go downhill again. Chapter 7, chapters 8, chapters 9, chapter 10, chapter 11 of Genesis, all is this unraveling of the earth and this spiritual heritage. And we come to the, the Abraham's family, and they're actually of the line of Shem, which is supposed to be the holy line that came out of Noah's three sons. And yet, where do we find Abraham and his family? They're in Ur. And are they God worshipers? Are they the worshiper of Yahweh? No, they are pagans. They are worshipers of the Canaanite gods. 
We tend to think of Abe, because we come to know him after God has called him, as a kind, genial fellow, kind of like a, a wonderful spiritual grandfather. But Abraham was a pagan. Do you know what they did in pagan worship practices? It was no good. It was evil and depraved what they did. And these are the type of things that Abraham participated in. And yet, God still comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, you're my boy. Abraham, I'm calling you. God's grace, he has started over already. And now he's starting over again. Because God's grace, as we see in the story of the Bible, is very stubborn. It is a long-suffering grace. Now, really quickly, what is grace? It is something bigger and stronger than niceness. Right? We think of grace as like, oh, they have all the, the graces of a high society person. Right? They, they, have, a, they have a niceness in a way that they know how they're supposed to act. But grace, as we talk about in the church, is favor in the absence of merit, which means you don't deserve it or merit it or earn it. But it's actually more than that. Grace is not just favor in the absence of merit, but grace is favor in the presence of demerit. Not only do you not deserve it, you've done everything that is necessary for you probably, you should never, ever, ever get it. And yet do we see, what does God do in chapter 12? He gives grace to a pagan who was not looking for God, was not worshiping the true God, and yet God zeroes in. Out of all the people of the earth, he zeroes in on Abraham. You ever gone to Google Earth? I'm not sure, do people still do this? It was really popular there for a while when we first discovered Google Earth where you go and you can see the whole world and you can kind of, you can hit that plus button. It goes in tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter to where you can see your car in the driveway. Look at this. There's all these people living in the world. And yet God in his grace and his mercy zeroes in on this man. And that is a baffling thing. When you consider that he has also done this for you. That of all the people in your family, and of all the people that we're surrounded by, and in the, in the face of all of your sin and all of your demerit, that he had the grace and the mercy to zero in on you. Why has God chosen to do so? Because God loves him. Why does this pagan worshiper worship God? Because God loves him. Because God has changed him, informs him, and calls him. There is something about grace that if we understand it rightly, it is inexplicable to us. We, it is not to be explained. You know something that's inexplicable? Let me give you an illustration. Sergeant R.D. Reed, he was a rear gunner in World War II. Um, and he was flying a, a B-24 Liberator. He was the, the rear gunner. So if you know that, that plane, it's like this little bubble. The back tail of it is where they would sit. Rather exposed rather exposed if you're flying through German flak. And he, on a particular, uh, they were out flying and they were going to bomb a railway yard and, and they were flying through the German flak and their, their plane was hit. Now, he realized in the midst of this that their plane is not doing well. And, and so he actually has to try to climb back up into the main compartment of the plane because he realizes he does not have his parachute. And, and, and this is not a good thing if this plane were to start to go down or begin to, to fall apart, as he was seeing, and the plane was, was rather rapidly breaking into pieces. And he sought to climb up, but there was a fire in the main plane. So when he climbed up in there, his hands touched the ladder, and they immediately just burned, and he fell back into the, the compartment where, he was, where this gun was. And he slammed his head, and he went unconscious. The next thing he remembers is waking up to a horrendous and very cold gust of wind. And to his horror, he realizes that he is in the tail of the plane which has broken off the rest of the plane. Now, mind you, he never got his parachute. So at 22,000 feet, he realizes he has no parachute, and he's in the tail of a plane that is falling very, very rapidly to earth. Now, if you're in such a scenario, um, what are some of the things that you would think about? One, you would think about, well, I would prefer not to land. That cannot be good for me. Another thought would might be, though, I don't want to land, but I really hope this is over soon because this is really scary. Well, in any case, several miles away, he crashes into a crop of trees 
And that tale with him in it comes to rest on a frozen ground there in Italy. And a few minutes later, he emerges from the airplane tail. He had some burns on his face and some bruises, but not one single broken bone. Now that is inexplicable. And that is the level of inexplicability that your, the grace of God is in your life. That Yahweh's grace would be poured out on you in that way. That you would go, I'm alive, and I have no idea why. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 29, Paul goes into rather uh, graphic, he speaks very lowly of us in regards to how, when God calls us. He says this, for consider your calling, brothers, not that many of you were wise by worldly standards, nor many of you powerful, nor of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong, and God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human might boast in the presence of God. Why were you chosen? It's inexplicable to me that he would choose me. But our DNA, this is who we are from the very beginning, is we are a people saved by grace, which is why our first membership vow reflects our DNA as a church. We do it a couple times a year where people take their membership vows, and that membership vow goes like this. I am a sinner justly deserving his displeasure and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy. The first requirements for admittance into the church of Jesus Christ, into the people of God, is to admit that you don't deserve to be there. That is what makes you fit to be there, is to see that it is all of grace. That is the core, at the core part of our DNA. So we are saved by grace. Second, second aspect of our DNA that we see for the people of God here in this call to Abraham, that we are a people who are sent by God. The first word is what? Go. Abraham, get on up and get out of here. That is what he says. He says, leave your country. That's the NIV translation. But the old King James rightly translates it when it says, get thee out, which is a funnier way to put it. Because there are two Hebrew words here, not one. Literally, God, God says, go yourself out. Get yourself out. That is what he is saying. And think about how challenging and difficult a call this would have been to Abraham. Abraham is 75 years old. Listen, I'm 41, and I'm already trying to shrink the grid of my life. I ain't going out anywhere. I want to go nowhere. Less and less. My grid is getting smaller. Can you imagine being 75 and being like, you know what? I think this is a good time for you to pack up and uh, start a caravan out in the desert. This is what I would like you to do. This is who Abraham is, 75 years old. He has established a family that is close around him. He has all his, his uncles and his, his nieces and his nephews and his parents. He has actually somewhat comfort that that world could provide in the ancient Near East. In fact, in some areas, this was a fairly established part of the world. Some cities at this point even had some wa running water in their homes. Abraham would have had servants, family members, lots of livestock, he, he, you don't want to be a person who wanders in the desert. That kind of life is insecure. He has life in the city where there's protection. Abraham was part of society. He was wealthy and well-connected. And God says, I want you to uproot yourself from all of these things. He says, Abraham, I know you have everything to lose, but get up and go. Get on out of here. And this call, which make, this makes it even more difficult, is it comes with no particular object or end. He just says, go, and then what does he say? Where am I going, Abraham says. God says, I'm not telling you. I just want you to go. Go to the land. He doesn't say, go to the land altitude and longitude here, 25 miles. Go take the interstate down, take the third right. That's where I'm going to call you to go. He gives him no direction. He just says, go. Now, you understand how difficult that would be? Most of us don't like to call, follow God's instructions when he's absolutely clear with us as to what we are supposed to be doing. Like, love your neighbors, and we go, are we sure that that is what you want us to do? Are we sure? Imagine being told that you have to go. I'm not going to tell you where you're going. And, and mentally how difficult this would have been. Now, here, here, let me see if I can liken it to this. Some of you have gotten to the whole workout thing. You, you do the crossfitting thing or the hit class thing. or Some of you even have the personal trainer thing. 
All right? Now, here's one of the challenges of when you do these classes is, is, they, is they tell you what you have to do. So I want you to imagine, here's one of the, the exercises that you, we all least like to do, which is a burpee. Burpees were fashioned in the, the mountains of Mordor. Uh, they're a thing of, of utter evil uh, in this world, okay? All right. So the only thing worse is a devil thrust. All right. So it, burpees are awful. So imagine your personal trainer, the person leading the class goes, all right, do burpees. Now, all of us are usually, we're used to them going, you're going to do burpees for 30 seconds, or you're going to do 10 burpees, or you're going to do 15 burpees. And what if someone comes to you and simply just goes, start doing burpees, and you go, how many? Just do burpees. <laughs> how long? I'm not telling you. Just start doing burpees, and we'll see when you get there. This is what God says to do for Abraham to do. Get on out, and I'm not going to tell you where to go. I have no intention of telling you where I'm, t- where I'm calling you to be. Now, two applications. I want to try- draw this down from the ridiculous into the little more apl- applicable for us. This call to go and this identity as sent ones is, it has these applications for us. First is this. The call to be sent ones is a call to relinquish control. It demands that he be the one in control, not you. That's what it's saying. We tend to think that we can get away from Abe's problem. That as New Testament Christians, that we have a Jesus who is, is very loving. It's about security and comfort. This is how we, we as Christians often talk these days. And, and, yet, and yet that's not actually how Jesus talks to us. You see, Jesus says something like this, like he said in Matthew 10. Whoever loves father or mother or more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his, his cross and follow me is not worthy of me of me. This is a tough call to be sent ones. But it, it, this is the same thing that is being, you're being called to do in, in Genesis chapter 12, 1. That you're to be a sent one that submits your life to him. That, d- that relinquishes control to him. That does what he demands that we do. The Lord Jesus is demanding the place of supreme affection and supreme control in your life. Now, we look at that and we go, I want to know exactly where God is taking me, what he is asking me to do, and what the commitment is. But that is not faith. Faith says, get on up, out of here, and you have to trust me that I will take you in a place that will be good for you. There's a temptation in our hearts, though, that we will only follow God as long as we can still remain in control. God actually says to Abraham, get out. And Abraham says, where? And God says, I'll show you later. Just go. And later, he's going. And so he says, I'll give you a son. And Abraham says, how? And God says, I'm not going to tell you that either. I'll show you later. And then he says, go. Then he says I've given you a son now. Now go up on the top of a mountain and, and sacrifice your son to me. And Abraham goes, but how are you going to keep your promises? And God goes, I'll, I'll show you that too. But just obey me. That's the life of a Christian. That is very hard. We want to know exactly where God is taking us. To say, God, I will acknowledge you only when, only when you let me keep some portion of the control here. And God says, get out and follow me. Follow me. Drop your nets. Drop your life and follow me. This is the radical call of faith that God has given to Abraham, and he gives to you as well. And some of you have taken up that call. You didn't even know. <laughs> Some of you adopted it and you were like, this is going to be great. And isn't this beautiful and lovely? And then God said, oh, some of you decided to have four and five kids. And you were like, isn't this lovely? We have a big, huge, beautiful family. And then you were like, oh, no. This got really hard. Some of you said we want to have children. And then you found out you were infertile. That is a difficult thing. What is God going to call us to? Your, your, your task is to say, God, I'm open-handed. It is to your control I relinquish my life. The second way in which I think this call should shape us is it should shape our expectations. The call to be sent one should shake our expectation. And this is, I want you to get this. Because so many of you, like we're having all these babies and some of you are putting down roots. And Carrollton is a great place to be, isn't it? I love being in Carrollton. And I love being a part of this church, and I love having more people here in this church, and this is a great community, and I want to raise my kids here. But we need to become friends with the notion that we may always live a displaced life. We need to become familiar with the notion that God may call us always to be living some form of a displaced life. 
that we are sent ones, not ones who root ourselves in, you know, he may say you're physically in one place, but life is always changing around you. And calling you to different things and the different tasks. That might mean a family in our church leaves for another country to go be missionaries, and they were your best friends. That gets, that's hard. That might mean, if we get real practical, it might mean you have the greatest community group on earth. And you guys have spent two years together, and we, you've become friends with those people, and your kids are being raised together, and it's a sweet, sweet community, and the church goes, hey, we need new leaders. And you go, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll split. We'll become two. Some of us will go. We'll start another community group. It may be as simple as, as this. And maybe begin like this. Maybe it means, hey, I, I don't just have the same little circle of people I talk to every single Sunday. But after church, I particularly, I get displaced relationally. That God puts me in a place around people that are, aren't like me. It might mean that we send a group of our friends to plant churches somewhere else. Where we go, isn't it great that we are a big, happy family? And then we go, so seven of our families, we're going to send you away. And we go, wait, those are my friends. And they ran the children's ministry. Now what? Things like that, then it becomes very, very challenging and painful for us. You may be asking, well, what is God's call in my life right now? In what way is God calling me to be displaced? What ministry is he calling in me into? Do I lead a community group? Do I go with a church plant? Do I need to go overseas? Do I need to change jobs? Do I need to move to a different neighborhood? And the answer, of course, is I don't know. And you probably don't either. And there is something comforting about the way Abe responds. God says go. And does God give him really any other instructions? No. And what does Abe do? He just goes. He gets up. He kind of gets to choose the direction, and he just goes. Now, there is all this stuff that he doesn't know. When will the child come, this offspring that you promised me? Where are these blessings? What will they be like? When when will I get to the land? What land will I occupy? How much of this will I see in my lifetime? What does he know? Not much. All he knows is this, go. And so Abraham went. And one of the best pieces of wisdom I know of is this. This isn't biblical. I mean, this isn't like rise to like, you know, we're adding this at the end of Revelation. None of that. This is, I think, earthly wisdom. When you don't know what to do, do what you know to do. When you don't know what to do, do what you know to do. Abraham had one instruction, go. So you know what he did? He went. Now, fortunately, you and I have a lot more things the Bible has given us, more than simply go. But we can begin there. If you're confused, Lord, what is it you're calling me to do? I am not really sure. But he's given you many, many, many clear commands. And you go there and you start with what you do know. And then you see what the Lord does with it. That he might call you to live in love in a certain in a particular way. But simply this, go. This is your identity. This is our DNA that we are sent ones. Last one. Last one. Second, or last is this, is an error of our DNA, is that we are blessed to bless. This is where we have been. In fact, we can actually even go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, right? Be fruitful and multiply. Jesus, our God looks at, he creates all the world. He get, has the garden and the trees and the forest and the animals. It's this wonderful place of blessing and, and flowing water and fruit and food. And he says, look at all the ways I've blessed you. Now be fruitful and Multiply. It says this in chapter, in chapter 12 of Genesis, verse 2 or 3, I'll make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. Why? So that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who honors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Our DNA is blessing. It is the DNA of God's people. Now, we, we have to... Just real quickly, we have to address the silliness of what comes to mind when we think of blessing and the vapidness of what we think of blessing, right? We think of blessing as hashtag blessed, right? And we think of like all these inane, vapid, silly things that we would say, that makes my life blessed. 
But that's not what he's saying. So let me just give you a litany of the blessings that God gives us. We looked at this a, a, a couple years ago, and we looked at Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. In chapter 1, he says this, Praise God that he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. So let me just lift off a few of those. One, he has chosen you. Second, he's made you holy and blameless. Third, he's given you sonship. Fourth, he's given you redemption. Fifth, he's given you an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Sixth, he's given you the Holy Spirit who assures you. Then he, Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. He says "God, this, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. That's a blessing. Life is a blessing. Made us alive. By grace you've been saved and raised us up and see this with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us and Christ Jesus. He saved you so that you can then for all of eternity be the object of his blessing. Hashtag blessed. So yes, hashtag blessed doesn't even begin to describe it, but we could, we could do a lot worse. But seeing that this is the blessing that we are meant to have in Christ Jesus, that, that that is meant to course in us and through us, it is a two-way blessing. It is a blessing you get, and it is a blessing you become. You become this, this vessel in which God pours his blessing so that you might be poured out. And poured out for Who? Who does it say will be blessed because of all the blessing that Abraham's going to get? All the nations, all the families of the earth. When God calls Abraham out and blesses Abraham, this is not the end of God's salvation work. Did you know that? This is really important for us very individualistic, frankly, fairly narcissistic, selfish people in America, that you are not the end-all, be-all of God's salvation work in this world. God did not go, man, that's nice. I got to save this one guy and his family. It's a good day. It's a good day. Nope. He said, no, I want to save this guy, and then I want to save all the families of the earth. God has such a grand vision for what he's doing here. This is God's vision for the world, that his salvation, as we sang earlier, that the message of this, that the kingship of Jesus would come to the four corners of the world so that all peoples and all creatures rise up and say, our God reigns. Why did God bless Abraham? Well, yes, it was to bless Abraham, and praise be to God that he blesses us. But then he does so, so that we might be the blessings of all the people of the earth, and so it is. He blesses us. He blesses us with Jesus and all the spiritual blessings. But here's the turning point and crux of the whole thing. How does, how does God bless the nations through Abraham? Now, there are all these, 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 if you look at the Old Testament, there's all these places where you see that Israel, in these little tiny moments, members of, of Abraham's family become a blessing. We see it just a couple generations later, right? There's a guy named Joseph who gets taken off into captivity. And what happens because of Joseph and the wisdom, the ways in which God blesses Joseph? There's a, he tells Joseph there's going to be a famine in the land. God has gifted Joseph as an incredible administrator. Joseph does all that is necessary to prepare Egypt for the famine. And then it says in Genesis that all the nations of the earth come to Egypt in order to find food. God blessing the nations through man. That's actually why we also have this account of the Queen of Sheba coming to Solomon, right? Queen of Sheba, she's a real thing. Solomon is so wise that the kings and queens of the earth hear about the wisdom and about the beauty of Jerusalem. And so what do they do? The nations begin to flock. They begin to be blessed. But what is the great fulfillment? What is the ultimate fulfillment of this? How are the nations of the world going to be blessed through Abraham and his family Well, the opening words of the New Testament are very interesting. It's about a family. What is the opening section of the New Testament in Matthew? A genealogy. Now, normally we read that and we go, oh, it's flyover country. Let's move on to the next part. But what is a genealogy? It's the genealogy of Jesus. And it's genealogy of Jesus that traces Jesus' line all the way back to Abraham. The New Testament begins with this line from Abraham to Jesus, and Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of how God blesses the world through Abraham, because Abraham's descendant, Jesus, is the one through whom redemption will come from sin. 
that the mercy of God will be poured out, that the forgiveness of sins is offered, that restoration is extended and healing, and it's sonship, that the sons and the daughters that are wandering this world will be brought into God's family, that they'll be given a healing and an inheritance in life, and they're given the world. Jesus is the great blessing from Abraham, and he's the great blessing of the children of Abraham. He is the blessing that we need. But while we are the ones who are blessed to be a blessing, Jesus ultimately is the one who is cursed so that we might have the blessing. Galatians chapter 3, verses 13, it says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to Gentiles. The great fulfillment of the promises to Abraham that is that God is going to take care of everything that is broken and that is wrong in this world, whether it's physical or spiritual, everything that is shattered in this place. And he says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a blessing, but I'm going to do so by cursing my son. The one who is to inherit the earth, the one who actually deserves it all, he's going to receive a curse on the cross so that through him all the peoples of the earth might be blessed. Now what does that mean for us? And what does it mean for how we are to be a blessing? Oh yes, I'm blessed with Jesus so that I can bless the earth, but what kind of blessing are we giving? We are blessed to be a blessing, but the ultimate blessing that we are given is Yes, we have, yeah, we have great wealth here, and we have children, we have safety, we have medical care, but the ultimate blessing is the fact that you've been given Jesus. All the spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus, and therefore, what does that mean? What is the greatest blessing we can offer the world? It is to offer them Jesus. That we are to be a people of the blessing, which means we are to extend by means of all other lesser blessings. That means money and our energy and our time and our work. All these blessings that God has given us, these lesser, lesser things than Jesus, those are all meant to help prop up your work in blessing the world by giving them Jesus. Is this what we're about are we here to be a blessing? Is this our focus? Bob and Sharon Drews were missionaries in Japan. They went with our denominational mission board. And they were in Japan for three years. It was post-career. It's what they did for kind of a retirement thing. Hey, let's do three years in retirement in Japan. And, but they were missing their grandchildren like crazy. They had six grandkids. And they were nearing the end of the three years. And they had been approached by... By, the, by MTW, Mission to the World in Japan, hey, would you be willing to stay longer? Would you be willing to stay longer? And so they're about to leave to go back to the States when one of their missionary members took the, the Bob, um, it's Bob and Sharon, Bob out and, and sat him on a park bench and he, they said, look at the families in this park. Look at the children. And Bob was struck there and he says, we can't go back. We can't go back. And so he goes to his wife and he says, I don't think we can go back. And she said, actually, I, I, I'm not hearing that same thing from God. I want to go back. I want to see my grandkids. But she said this, but take me to the bark bench where you, we were sitting where God spoke to you. And so they went and they sat and it only took a few minutes when she turned to her husband and she said, if you're watching the children playing in that playground, we have to stay. She says, here's why we have to stay. We have to stay here for any number of more years because all six of my grandchildren have Christian parents. None of these kids have Christian parents. All six of my grandkids have a Christian community that they can be a part of. None of these kids have a Christian community that they can be a part of. All six of my grandkids have a Christian school that they can go to, and not one of these kids in Japan does. So let's stay. It's an interesting way. She actually saw the blessing that had already come to the next generation. She said, ah, they've already been blessed. 
And isn't that like, that speaks to the grandparents' heart, right? You long to see your grandkids and your great-grandchildren walk with Jesus. What a blessing to be able to see such a thing. And they said, we've already seen it. We have that blessing. Our children and our grandchildren walk with Jesus. And so what does it look like to extend that blessing to the world? Now, this is a radically different way of viewing your life. Becoming a Christ follower means viewing everything in your life as something to be multiplied for the kingdom of God. God is a rich giver and a good father who loves to give incredible blessings to his children, but he doesn't give blessings for simply for us to play with them by ourselves in our room for us to enjoy. He blesses us so that we might bring those blessings and offer them to God and say, God, how might you use these things in order to bless the nations? Now, some of you are saying, I don't feel very blessed. My life's been pretty hard. And that is true for many of you. No matter who you are or what season you, that God has put you in, though, understand if you have Jesus, you are blessed. And so it, it, this might even reframe the hard seasons that you're in. So let's say you're in a season of suffering. Hashtag blessed is not your Twitter handle. But what do you have? What do you have? You have the experience of suffering and experiencing Jesus' provision for you in the face of suffering. What is something that people say when they've experienced deep suffering? They come out of it, and what is one of the things they say? They go, I cannot imagine having gone through this without Jesus. In other words, what is the blessing you have to offer? You have the, you have the blessing to offer people the Jesus who is near you in suffering. It's Jesus. He's the blessing. And sometimes he frames in the ways in which you're going to be called into mission. Some of you, it's I'm very, very wealthy. And yet, you know what I've realized? I can give it all the way because having Jesus is better. So what is it for you? Is it a season of suffering or wealth? What is it that God has blessed you with That is the context in which you get to offer the world the blessing of Jesus himself. So what has God been giving you? He's given you himself, so you might give him to others. We have him in abundance. And know it's awesome. Know what the one prayer request, the one prayer request that you pray for, he will always answer. When you ask for more of him, he always answers that. Which means this, that when you tap into Jesus, you tap into an eternal wellspring of blessing. Let's ask him to help us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I I am acutely aware at how much my life does not represent this to be true, what I've just preached on. And Lord, so Heavenly Father, I pray that you would come and convict my own soul. That, Lord, you would actually, that I would begin to have a looser grip on the things of this world. And that, frankly, Lord, I think it might make me a more bearable person. And so, Heavenly Father, I I pray that you would loosen my grip that what you put in my hands would be like water, that it would be there to refresh me for just a second, but then to be extended and splashed out upon the earth for the goodness of this world. So Heavenly Father, I pray that your spirit would flow. Would you come and refill us by the mighty water of your spirit to remind us of who we are and what you've called us to be in this world. Lord, would, would King's Chapel be a place, be a place in which if it, that the people of our city would look at it and say, this city is blessed because that place exists. Because those people exist in this community. Oh Lord, above all other reputations, would that be the reputation you give us? That people would smell and experience the blessing of Christ Jesus through the members of this church as we go out. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.